Good morning and welcome everyone and thank you for joining our online service this morning. Um, to read out of um, our call to worship, I'm going to read out of Psalms 25 verses 4 to 4 to 5. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God my Savior and my hope is in you all day long. I'll invite the group up to lead us in worship this morning.
uh, way of announcements this morning, I got two announcements I want to mention. And one is in regards to the passing away of uh, Pastor Corny Martins. Uh, he passed away on Thursday, May 28th. We all treasure the ministry he and Mary have done in most of our churches and beyond. Please pray for his family as they grieve this loss. A come and go viewing will be held on Tuesday, June 2nd at 7 o'clock at the Birchwood Funeral Chapel in Steinbach. A private family funeral service will be held on Wednesday, June 3rd, with burial take place at the Heritage Cemetery in Steinbach. In lieu of flowers, donations in memory of Cornelius could be made to Cancer Care Manitoba. Let's uh, pray at this time. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. Lord, we thank you for uh, this time we can spend together, even though that we are apart uh, physically, but in uh, spirit we'd be in one. Lord, I want to pray for um, people that have been hurting this week, maybe in losing a loved one. Pray for those that they would feel your comfort this time. I pray for those who are rejoicing, Lord God, we can rejoice with them as well. Lord, I just thank you so much that we can rely on you in all our circumstances. May they be highs or lows. Help us to be still before you, Lord God, and know that you are in control. We pray a blessing over everyone here. And Lord, may you bless this service. May we uh, have a greater faith in you, Jesus. In your name, amen. Good morning. It is uh, good to be able to share God's word with you this morning. Uh, on that note, uh, John 1 verses 1 and 2 say, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and he was with God in the beginning. And uh, we get to look at some of his word again this morning, which is really good. Um, all these years later, we can still look to God's um, inspired word written through different men and women with different characters throughout them and it's uh it's just awesome to do and it's kind of neat that after all these years we still can't uh, plumb the depths of depths of it uh today is may 31st which is also the same day that we get to celebrate pentecost um i did say last week that we were going to continue looking in james and we will do that but we're going to just touch on uh, Pentecost as well a little bit. Now, uh, the Pentecost wasn't just a New Testament thing. It actually started Old Testament. Um, Leviticus chapter 23 verses 16 and 17 uh, start this process off. And uh, those verses read as follows. And this is Leviticus 26, 16, 17. Count off 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath, uh, which was the Passover, according to their calendar, and then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. From wherever you live, bring two loaves made of two-tenths of an ephah, or eph yeah, ephah, of the finest flour baked with yeast as a wave offering of the first fruits to the Lord. So, back in uh, when they're um, going to be going towards the Exodus. Before that, he was already giving them these uh, festivals, these festivities, these times to remember. And this is what he's talking about here, 50 days after the celebration of the Passover, which is what they were coming up to at that time of this writing. Now, Numbers 28 verse 26 also talks on this gives a, a little different um, added note to it. And that says, On the day of first fruits, when you present to the Lord an offering of new grain during the festival of weeks, which is what we just were described in Leviticus, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. So he's saying you need to take time to stop and give God you're a wave offering, uh, and he gives specifics as to two loaves and that sort of thing. But the point here is that you set aside some time. It's not a regular work day. Don't worry about, you know, making some money, filling, you know, your, your grain bins, that sort of thing. But also that he says here, it's first fruits. This is a festival that they would 
get together and celebrate you know, um, their new grain and they would say, okay, here, we're going to take this and this is God's. This is first fruits. So celebration and a, a remembrance of the first fruits of what God has done for us. Now, we can turn and uh, we go into the New Testament. Uh, in Romans chapter 8, verse 23, um, just a little touch on this, and uh, the writer says, not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we eagerly await for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. And this is, again, just saying, um, bringing into tie together this first fruits, first of all, back then it was the grain, and here now it's the first fruits of the Spirit. So the Spirit gives us first fruits, um, we're waiting, as at least the writer was here, of, for our redemption of our bodies. And that brings us into Acts. And um, in Acts chapter 2, um, it's talking more specifically about what we normally think about at Pentecost. So in Acts chapter 2, the first four verses, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house and where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in to other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So here on the baptizing of the Holy Spirit, if I can put it that way, on this day that we still celebrate Pentecost was this filling of the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit was there. He was working and doing things. But here in this context, Jesus had said, go and wait until you receive the Spirit after He had ascended up to heaven, after be, uh, being crucified and, and He was and resurrected. And here, that's the day that we still, on this time, 50 days after the Passover, we celebrate this. And now it's not a big celebration where we pass out gifts or we you know, change a lot of our schedules. We don't have a weekend off kind of thing. At least most of us don't take extra days for this. But it's something to remember. We've remembered that we receive the Holy Spirit when we accept Christ. He reminds us to remember this. It's important enough that even back in Leviticus, he was already setting this stage, reminding us, give of your first fruits. Set aside time to remember what God has done for you. And the Spirit, as he fills us, gives us gifts. We who have the first fruits of the Spirit, as said in Romans, you and I are gifted as well. I don't say gift in the sense that one of us can run fast and one of us can, can throw further and one. I'm saying gifts of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness. Those kind of gifts, but also gifts that we can use for God's kingdom. And I think when we look at this entire uh, stage that God sent, first, first starting in Leviticus and then throughout Scripture, that we need to take the time to remember those gifts, to glorify God by giving back a wave offering as per se and to give God back our first fruits gift wise and even financially as they did they gave of their grain and so today well now when we're going to switch and look into the book of James again which is a practical book it talks about more of do's and don'ts kind of concept we still need to remember that we have to take the time to slow down, set aside our regular work, glorify and honor God with our gifts, and look to the Word, which was back then, um, as we read in John, the beginning always was, always will be. And then to look as to how we can take that and put it into a practical, step-by-step, day-to-day things that we do. So now on that note, let's looking into James. We had talked to James last week, um, specific things of do's and don'ts, and this is the concepts, you know, we should try to do this and be that way. 
James chapter 2 starts off with an interesting verse. And he says here, James chapter 2 verse 1, My brothers, as believers in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Now, I think of favoritism and I go, really, who does that? <laughs> we all do, in different aspects and different ways. Now, in James here, right after that, he gives the examples of, or an example of a rich man coming for supper and a poor man coming for supper. And usually this was in a context of where they would actually come together. And, well, the rich man looks good, he, he's well presented, he's dressed to the nines, he's wearing a thousand dollar tuxedo kind of thing. And then comes the poor guy who's got, you know, a, a set of Walmart sweats and a t-shirt that he bought at the thrift store. And they don't want to set these two guys in the same table, so they, you know, they usher the one guy into the back row, or maybe in the side seating where he can, you know, catch, catch what he's, what's going on but not be a part of. And the guy with the big suit on comes in, or the lady who's dressed just right, and she comes up, they're important, and they get front row seating where they can interact with what's going on. It doesn't talk about that, but it's talking about, based upon human perception, where people are to be involved with whatever situation. And I think that we still do. Now, maybe we don't invite extremes like that to a, a table, as it says in James chapter 2, but we do that in almost anything. It's, and we always, always have a reason for it. Sports teams, you're going to pay the one because he's better, and well, of course, we want to win the game. But they carries that throughout, whether it's picking of teams, whether it's um, hanging out with people, it's what we're doing and when we're doing we want to, it's interesting, I'll use this example. You want to buy a car. Most of us don't want to go to the small Ma and Pa kind of dealership because the building is small, it's run down, it's, it's not fancy, they don't have all the latest and greatest stuff. We want to go to the dealership that looks good, where you walk into the showroom and you're impressed. The lighting is beautiful. The sun can come in. The heating's always at the right level. Everything is spotless. The shop, the garage looks amazing. We don't stop and realize we're going to pay for all that. And I'm not against that. What I'm saying is we show favoritism in all sorts of areas. But if we continue in James chapter 2, going up to verse 8, some of those details aren't so much as important as to what favoritism reveals about ourselves. In verses 8 through 10, it's the, James writes, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. Now I can sit here, I can stand here and tell you how horrible favoritism can be. Whether it's based on looks, wealth, gender, anything. We can always take and see how bad that is and we can brush it off. It's actually not that big a deal because I don't do that, you can say to yourself which possibly we don't. But when we do, it's very minor. But James says, hang on a sec. It's not so much just the favoritism, which we will expect that must have been a situation, an issue to the church, which would have been a complete, all of the churches, whether because they didn't meet all in just one location, just like we have many churches. But they would have, called it the assembly, as he does, does in chapter 1. They had an issue with favoritism. But the point here, more importantly, is we need to realize when we make one break of the law, when we sin in one area, great or small, 
It shows our heart and it actually makes us guilty of all of it. Now, if we would continue reading in there specifically, it talks about um, murder and adultery, which are horrible things in any society, whether it's in a Christian background or in a completely secular. Even in a jail, we would see some of those things as wrong. And it says if you are showing favoritism, you take maybe it's a simple thing, But if your heart isn't where it should be, if you don't love your neighbor as yourself, you're guilty of all of it. And that's the main point, I believe, of this concept of favoritism. Maybe it wasn't a big deal back then either. Maybe it was uh, fairly simple. But it does affect all of us. Uh, Just to throw a verse into here to give us an idea of that, Here's a verse taken out of Revelation 21, verse 8. And listen to the list of sins. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and I'll stop there for a second, those are all bad things. Unbelieving, vile, murder, sex. We, we go, ooh, yeah, we, we don't want to touch those. And all liars is the last one. Their place will be in the fire lake of burning sulfur. We go, yeah, yeah, liars are bad. But if you've sinned on one item, you're guilty of all. And all of us want to say, well, I'm not a liar. Have you lied? You're still guilty. Have you committed a murder? Of course you're guilty, right? We see that. Practice magic arts? No. Idolatry? Odds are good. All of us covet something other than what we have. All of us are guilty of sin. And James is taking something that could be fairly simple, an easy fix. And in his example, you've got the rich man and the poor man. And he says, actually, you're showing favoritism. Don't do that. And we go, well, that I can fix. We can, you know, set the guys side by side. You know, the ladies, just because they're not dressed the same, it's okay if they don't color match. We can put them together. They'll be fine. We can fix favoritism. But are we fixing our heart? That's what James is asking us to do here. I truly believe that. And it means a lot to James, as we mentioned last week, and we will continue that, because he kind of changes a little bit here in James chapter 2, verse 14. He says, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Okay, We've read these words before. Uh, we understand that... Um, In verse 26 of there, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Tell me you have faith, but you don't do it, it's dead. Just like if you do great things, but if you don't have faith in Christ, it still doesn't, you're not saved. We cannot work our way to heaven. And we know that, and we've heard that, and we we're not doing that because it's salvation through Christ alone that gives us out, gets us to heaven. And we have to accept it, to believe in it. And James is saying, now you've got to actually act it out. Faith, if not accompanied by action, faith without works is dead. James says that more than once in this passage. Here in chapter 2 specifically, he says it, verse 14, verse 26. And then he goes into it saying, you know, show me this and I'll show you that. If you you have deeds but you don't have faith, it doesn't count. If you tell me that you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you know, I go to church, I raise my holy hands, I give, I do, or I shouldn't say I do, I, I, I believe that. You say it. 
but you don't actually act it out. I'm, I'm a believer in God, I go, I, but I don't go to church. Okay, well, none of us are going, going to church. But if you're not acting it out, if you say one thing, but don't do it, or you say one thing and do another, if you give, show favoritism, where's your heart at? If it walks like a duck, it looks like a duck, what are the odds? There's a verse here in chapter 2 that usually catches my attention. And that's verse 19. And he's right in the midst of what this we're discussing here. He's getting right into it. Before I read that verse, he talks about Abraham um, in verse uh, 21. Um, he talks about Rahab when the Israelites were coming into the promised land. Rahab was the one who helped the spies. Um, he says they did their faith. They acted upon what they believed. Okay, Verse 21 says, Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered Isaac? He was ready to sacrifice his son because he was told to. No explanation. And James here looks at that as it's not. He, he had the faith, but he acted it out. So he wasn't just speaking it. He did it. And on that note, um, verse 19 of chapter 2 of James says, you believe that there is one God. Good. Even the de demons believe that and shudder. That verse, no matter how many times I read it, always catches me. It always stops me at the moment and makes my heart to my mind go, ouch. Because I've heard it and I've said it. Yeah, I believe God. And I didn't act it. Before I fully gave my life to Christ, he would have asked me that at times, and I would say, yeah, 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 I believe there's God. But that's as far as it goes. Like, I, I believe there's a God, we're good. Can I go back to doing what I want to do now? I've acknowledged it. I wouldn't say it that way. But that's how I acted. Very similar to this verse. You believe there's a God? Good. But the demons believe the same thing. And are the demons going to be spending eternity with Christ in heaven? Of course not. We know that. The demons, when they stop and admit that there is a God in heaven, shudder. They're terrified of that concept. Yet mankind shrugs it off as if it's nothing. Yeah, I believe there's a God. You practice your faith your way, I'll practice it my way. Don't judge me, because if you judge me, now you're going to be judged. And that's about as far as they want to quote Scripture. It's as far as they want to use or act on their faith. The demons believe it. They know it's true. They don't act on their faith in God because they don't believe in God in the sense that they want Him to be the all-powerful ruler where Christ has died and has been resurrected for salvation of mankind. They don't care about that. All they want is what they want to be in charge. They think about God and they're scared. We think about God and we go, can I have a new color TV? God, I sure hope you don't cause it to rain today because I'm going fishing or golfing. Our actions always, eventually, will show what's inside. You can't hide that. You could put a nice fur coat or sheepskin over top of a wolf, you can't hide his tea all the time. 
they're going to come out. Faith without its works is dead. And your heart, if it's not loving your neighbor as yourself, things start to come out like favoritism, like lying, like sexual immorality, and the list keeps going. We may categorize our sins, but James is saying, it's not what you're doing in the sense of that specific thing. Where's your heart? Because if your heart isn't right, it's going to show. So, here we talk about that on this day we celebrate, as I started off with, Pentecost. We're talking about or remembering the day that God said, back in Leviticus, Numbers, set aside a day to remember the first fruits. Show, show me. Show me that I am important to you. When you get your paycheck, what's the first thing we spend it on? First fruits. And God did ordain that back in the, before the Exodus already. He had said, this is what you're going to do as you get out. He's telling the people then, I am important. I am a jealous God. I care. I will take care of you. Watch and see. And he did miracles that just blow us away today still. We need to remember that. We need to take today. Maybe you've got lots of things happening. Maybe, you know, the weather's going to be nice. Maybe not. The point is, what are you going to do with God's plan? Is what I want more important? Or is acting my faith out? more important than what I want. Take the time to ask God, God, with the gifts you've given me, what would you like me to do today as I remember what you have done for me? Act upon our faith. Show not just those close to us what's meaningful to us, but the world. Are we so busy we can't help our neighbor? Are we so busy that we can't take time to stop, to pray, to find out what's going on around us in a positive manner and bring those to God? Are we so busy that we can't stop and listen to nature? Are we so busy that we can't even praise God with our voices or our other gifts? How are we acting our faith out today? Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us with a grace that is just absolutely amazing. Whenever I find that I catch Mars, or when we find we catching ourselves losing our temper, being offended, um, being selfish, Lord, I pray that you would help us to remember the grace that you've showed us because you show us grace. You're an amazing God. Thank you. This is Pentecost. May we not forget the gift of the Spirit and the other gifts that you give us, not just through the Spirit, but through every day of our lives. Give us the strength, Lord, to act on our faith, to show the world that you are making a difference with us. And that you want to have a relationship with them as well. I thank you for each and every one who gets to stop and to take some time to check out your word and to let you speak to them. Bless them, Father. Bless all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I want to thank everyone for joining us this morning online. Uh, to leave you with a uh, benediction, I want to read out of Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 to 26. Verse 24. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Have a blessed week.